that music. He's not a bat, he's a man who fights crime And we're gonna watch him fight for a minute at a time With John and Will and I guess you just rhyme It's Bat Minute! Hello and welcome once again to Bat Minute Returns, the show that has indeed been properly housebroken, so you've got nothing to worry about there. I am one of your hosts, John Parker. I am the other host, Niall McGowan. Housebroken, not guaranteed. (laughs) I am yet another host, one who knows how to be housebroken, but also needs one of those furry astroturf pads. I'm Rick. (laughs) And I am your last host, Julia, who has to clean up after the semi-housebroken Rick. <laughs> and we're from the Mad Max Minute podcast. Oh, now, I, I, I'm picturing you going like a cat, but for Mad Max authenticity, it'd be more like a dog, I imagine. I don't think you could ever really have a wasteland situation with a cat, because the cat wouldn't look out for you. The cat <laughs> would ignore the raiders sneaking up on your vehicle and just allow you to be shot. <laughs> <laughs> the cat, you know, he's looking out for number one. The cat knows what's up. Got fiercely, fiercely independent. Yeah. Oh, they can speak in those, speaking of cats. In this uh. minute we do get the first proper line of dialogue from someone who may be mm. intricately connected with cats later on. Yes, yes. This, this is minute eight. And the minute starts with Walken being a boss, as always. And it ends with his son who's got a lot less of the cool factor. He, he yeah. hasn't inherited the cool. <laughs> Tragically, yeah. <laughs> Which is a shame. Uh, both as a character and as a man. Mm, yeah. Uh, uh, as we will discuss, I'm sure. Yeah. But yeah, yeah we do get the, uh, you know, Max Shrek still talking, still trying to pitch this power plant idea, even though they've been told, like, we don't need a power plant, we don't want a power plant, this <laughs> it, it ain't going to happen. But he, he does come out with this very poetic, you know, imagine. You know, a Gotham City lit up like a blanket of stars, but blinking on and off. Frankly, <laughs> I cringe, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> it's like, it's like, oh, my guy's selling me in this, but oh, my, we, we, we can't be blinking on and off. What the hell? <laughs> it's like, of course, this blinking on and off will be long after both the mayor and Max Shrek are dead in the middle <laughs> of the next century. But It's a very strange plan, then, as you say, because... People have pointed out to him that yeah, there's there's really no need for a power plant at all. There's, this yeah, is pointless. Yeah. It's like, I don't need a vacuum cleaner. Stop coming to my door and trying to sell me a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, um, actually, I may have said this on the show before. I, I used to live in Pakistan. And um, when you're a 15-year-old walking through the shops of Islamabad in Pakistan... It's very strange behavior when people come out and try and sell you rugs. Now, what 15-year-old English guy, like kid, is, is going to go, yeah, you know what? I want a really expensive 300-pound hand-sewn rug. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks for that. Yeah, you're really, you're really going for the right market here. But maybe it's your parents' birthday or something. It's like, oh, it's be a nice, uh, be nice to get them a rug. No, they're yeah. still expensive. Just because it's Pakistan, they're not cheap. <laughs> Let me tell you <laughs> And uh, I will note, though, that there's a distinct um, sort of difference, I think, in the characterization uh, of the mayor here. Because, again, you know, Mayor Roscoe Jenkins, in the script, constantly just referred to as the mayor, the Roscoe Jenkins element, apparently, is from the novelization, Mm. uh, where they decided to give him a bit more just of a personality and uh, and whatnot. (laughs) Thank God. Uh, Daniel Waters' original script has the mayor's bit more of a sort of, um, a bit more of a pushover. Because he, uh, you know, Shrek is pitching this, power plant or not the power plant the chemical plant you know he has the, the, the mayor responds with a real like oh max Shrek, you know my friend you're a pillar of this community you know the pillar there's no citizen whom gotham values more no citizen your buildings your stores your oil wells it, it goes on and on like that and then he says i've got to refuse permission for this chemical plant construction and apparently max sort of takes this very like very badly and he has he kind of sarcastically says like mm. oh please mr mayor don't drool or apologize. I appreciate your honesty. I appreciate your honesty, 
It's not the first time we've had a, degree, a disagreement. Golly, actually, it is. And then the mayor's like, but I'm sure it's going to be the last time, Max. And it, it seems like he's very desperately, <laughs> desperately trying to please Max Shrek. Whereas this mayor has a bit more of like a, uh, yeah, you know, no. <laughs> and what are you going to do? Like, I'm, I'm the mayor. You're some guy. That's it. That, I've said no. And even, I do appreciate, it was, it was in the last minute, but when, you know, Sh- Shrek's, so uh, is talking about the plant. The mayor does have a real exasperated sigh of like, "Oh God, here we go." He's going to try to pitch me this <laughs> yeah. thing, even though I've already said no. <laughs> like the, that establishes a strange thing to me that seems to occur in movies, especially comic book movies and things like that. Where again, it could just be me not understanding American things, but the mayor seems to have a lot of power. Mm. Now, in the UK, the mayor's kind of like a symbolic thing. They don't really do anything. That, that nobody cares about the mayor. Nobody's interested. Like, mm. But in these movies, they have a lot of say over what's going to happen. It's that Ghostbusters thing of, like, you need to go to the mayor's office. Yeah. Because that's, that's, they, they get anything sorted. we got to go to the mayor! Well, it's the, that's stemming directly from the inherent bureaucracy of a democratic system. Mm-hmm. You need someone there at the top to sign the papers and mm. cross the T's, dot the I's, and approve things as they come across municipal, uh, municipally. Because they're put in these positions by everybody around to deal with that minutia that yeah. other people don't want to have to deal with. The, the idea of a mayor, yes, it's very prestigious. You think of mayors of large metro- metropolitan cities mm. and how prestigious and politically powerful those positions are but they're there to do a job yeah yeah it's not a thing where they walk around town wearing a monocle a top hat and a sash <laughs> that's kind of what our mayors do except the mayor of london <laughs> <laughs> the mayor of london is a proper mayor i think but pretty much everywhere else it's like just just walk around and look cool for photos sometimes like. well, the, the current mayor sadiq khan is a proper mayor the, the previous mayor boris johnson was <laughs> was barely a person <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> Please, I'll be honest. I don't care if this loses followers. No, he he was not a human being by any stretch of the imagination. No. Well, apparently, he's got Trump's backing for the next prime minister. So, oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. We won't go. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, it's going to get progressively more difficult throughout the show to not talk about politics, but uh... <laughs> and not bring up especially Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah, there's a strange parallel going on. But um, but anywho, uh, we do get the you know the mayor once again batting away the uh, the suggestion of this this power plant. I do have to ask though, like, what 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 do we think happened to Mayor Borg? Do you think was he impeached after the whole? <laughs> I didn't do anything about the Joker until way <laughs> late on into it, and even then it was too late. So I, I I was just obsessed with getting a parade going, a parade that ended up killing loads of people. <laughs> <laughs> So, no, I think he. I think he was well respected and quietly retired. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I still like to think. Like, I can't remember if we mentioned it in the show. If this was a, if this was a thing I just thought up one day <laughs> independently. But I do. I would like it if you know, hot dog and balloon obsessed Mayor Borg went on to become the Tim Burton version of the Condiment King, where he was like this <laughs> hot dog themed supervillain, and then his major plan at the end was to crash a zeppelin. Painted like a hot dog into Gotham Ooh, Plaza. Amazing. And that was like before Batman stopped him. He was just like, oh, first Gotham, then the whole schmear. And then, you know, <laughs> Batman yes. drove his bat balloon into his balloon or something. I don't know. But, and after that, they're like, we need a new mayor. So they got in uh, Roscoe Jenkins over here. Oh, my God. That needs to happen. We need a comic book series all about this. <laughs> With so many like tv shows and comics pitched on like the the very minor <laughs> background sort of inner workings characters of the batman the tim burton <laughs> batman universe it's like i don't want to see anything about you know michael keaton's bruce no. wayne i much rather see something about what happened to the mayor previously and, <laughs> and you know what, what what's Knox up to the character we yeah. all hated in the last movie everyone likes stories like that that's why everyone likes the phantom menace right Oh, of course, of course, yes. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. I can't think of anybody that doesn't like that movie. No, it's everyone's favorite. You know, all the all the political debate and things like that. Uh, oh, and the pod racing. How can you forget the half hour <laughs> of pod racing? <laughs> I'll, I, I'll say this, right? I always used to say, oh, the pod racing's amazing. I love it. But going through minute by minute, listening to Star Wars Minute, it, it got quite 
not the show, but the the pod racing itself, it got quite old. Yeah. <laughs> well, racing in general, if you're not into the technical aspects of it, mm. can get tiring. Yes. Mm. Well, that, that's the thing. My my dad is really into motorbike racing. Like, not he's not done it himself, but he loves watching it. And I've watched it with him. And I like when I was a kid, he would take me to motorbike races and stuff. And the thing is, in Ireland, they have like just uh, basically it's like street racing. So they'll have like little country towns where they close off the roads and people in high powered motorbikes zoom around these little country lanes. And it's insanely, insanely friggin' dangerous. The thing is, but like, my dad will watch it on TV as well. And you just sit and it's just like, he'll watch it for like seven hours. He'll watch the entire, this is the Grand Prix. And it's just like, this is so boring. It's just like the same, it's just a bunch of bikes going around corners repeated <laughs> over and over and over again. It gets to the point where like, I just kind of want someone to crash just for something, not to, for them to die, but just so something will happen. Just to have something else to look at for 10 seconds. I think that's the main motivation by, or I think that's the main motivation of some Americans who sit and will watch NASCAR racing. Oh yeah. For multiple hours on end. Which is which doesn't even have the intense close calls of you know street level superbike racing because they're on a giant oval and they're constantly <laughs> turning left. <laughs> I've never understood that. Like, I mean, I've not watched it. it. Again, it's not a thing here. But how is it exciting and thrilling when they're just going in a circle? I would like, like to see a lot of American NASCAR racers brought over to England and put on a circuit where they have to constantly turn right and just <laughs> see how that messes with them. Oh my god, that would be incredible. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's one sport I never understood. I, I had a video game of it as a kid because I got it for free. And I tried playing it and I, I didn't get it. And I had another one. It was like, um, what's the other sport? Is it like IndyCar racing? <laughs> and uh, right, it's that's the same the more thing. international racing. Yeah. It's just bizarre. At least the Formula One, I don't find it interesting either, I'll be honest. But they turn. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> turns. It's nice, yes. But uh, anywho. Um... <laughs> Batman. Yeah. yeah. We yes. do get a little shot here of the uh, the other, the back wall of Shrek's office, which is this intensely cushioned wall for whatever reason. Mm. Again, apparently, <laughs> a nod to Metropolis. But it makes it look like it's like a rubber room or something as well. It's like it's a very odd design choice. I don't know if I'd put that up in my wall <laughs> personally. It's, but. it's so he can kill and no one can hear. Yeah. Soundproof. The many layers of Max Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be peeling all of them. And again, again, just bouncing off things from the mayor. We'll also note as well that like we have a new mayor here. But because uh, we constantly compared Mayor Borg to, you know, Murray Hamilton's mayor in Jaws, you note in Jaws too, Murray Hamilton's still the mayor in that movie. It's like, how did that happen? At, le at least <laughs> Gotham City got rid of the other guy. Amityville was like, no, no, that's fine. He, he, he wanted to keep the, the, the beaches open, but he's a good mayor. Other that, you know, see his cool anchor jacket? Cool. We love this guy. <laughs> you can get away with it. Yeah. If you've got an anchor jacket. Mm. But we, yeah, we have Shrek here doing the old uh, Lex Luthor in Smallville routine of a uh, power play of like turning your back to people and walking away from them in your office, which is like, if you ever watched Smallville, that's all he ever did. Which is like, <laughs> yep, as soon as someone would come into his office, he would just turn his back and then be like facing the camera while they're behind him and he would just pontificate something. And then he'd usually walk out of the office, even though it was his office. But uh, <laughs> it's a little, like, a little uh, callback to the, the, the hardcore Smallville fans that are out there. Woo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I, I sound like I hate the show. I don't hate the show. I just was like, eh. Mm. Okay. <laughs> it got really ambitious with its crossover material in those later seasons. Yeah. Mm, I think it had to. I think really. it's like a, yeah, pretty much every hero was represented except batman and except superman like, until the last episode and it's like those guys were like the first well how come everyone else every other minor superhero ever has appeared in this show and then the two main guys of like batman's <laughs> never gonna show up in it and superman's on like oh yeah finally yeah jesus he's, he's finally put on the goddamn suit we do get then uh the first line of dialogue from or the first proper line of dialogue from selena kyle michelle pfeiffer when she oh, yeah. tries to interject and uh, says, you know, she actually has a, a suggestion. And they all just, you know, creak in their chairs and sort of gaze at her with this very, like, what? Like, like they're <laughs> stunned that she's even said anything to them. 
I hope her suggestion is that someone run out and get some more grease for those office chairs. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah, but, but one thing, I am curious is like what 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 her suggestion was going to be. Like, it, like we don't know, but about Selena Kyle's background, maybe she know uh, you know she's got a degree in electric engineering or something, and she knows a lot about power plants, <laughs> and she actually has like a great suggestion to come up with here. But of course, these guys, you know, crusty old white guys in a, in a boardroom aren't going to listen to the secretary. So, Yeah, it's very frustrating that we never get to hear her suggestion or question. I like, though, that we don't hear it because it really does demonstrate how much she's just, you know, put down under the thumb. Like, she, she's not she's not a person. She's a thing there to just do his typing. Mm. Like, she just has no life, even. Yeah. She's barely... Uh, she's barely a character at this point, is she? Even when you see her go home in later scenes, spoiler, like, there's nothing going on for her at all. Yeah. Like, even the things that she... Yeah. Or the potential things don't pan out, so... Mm. And it's really sad. I do have to wonder, though, because we got the, you know, Michelle Pfeiffer rocking these giant specs. They disappear later on in the movie, too. Like, I wonder... Like, the, the, the whatever cat magic happens when she falls out the well, let's say falls when she's pushed out the window, does that cure her eyesight as well? Because they, they <laughs> they're so prominent in this, and it's a bit more of a kind of like she's all that situation. Like put some glasses on her, that'll make her look really nerdy. <laughs> she, she takes her glasses off, lets down her hair, and suddenly, <laughs> oh my god, that is Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, <laughs> pretty See, much. I think she she looks great both ways. So I'm, I'm happy with the glasses. I like glasses. I like the I like the implication that she's a lot more intelligent than she lets on because mm. we know at least in some version of Michelle Pfeiffer that she is a researcher into the quantum realm yeah. and works mm. very closely with Michael Douglas to become a superhero. Mm. Yes, of course, of mm. course. But uh, but yeah, of course. We, uh, this is you know we could talk a little bit about Michelle Pfeiffer now. Obviously, you have to spread out a lot of her stuff over the rest of the movie because she's one. She's kind of. Not the main character, but she does have one of the, the best arcs of the whole movie. So she is a, a very, you know, she is kind of like a main character. Like it's kind character. of her movie. Yeah, yeah, really. pretty much. Uh, but um, Sort of. Michelle Pfeiffer obviously worked her way up. Uh, she was she was in the, the one season wonder show, Bad Cats. Was like some sort of foreshadowing there? What, what, what the hell? Bad Cats. <laughs> uh, then it you know, went on to be in Scarface with Pacino. Uh, Grease 2, which is, you know, for so many years it was reviled as this awful sequel to Grease, and it seems to be lately clawing its way in as like, no, Grease 2 is like a classic now, for some reason. <sighs> I remember, see, as a kid, I saw that movie a hundred times because my sister is five years older than me, and she was the perfect age to be into Grease 2. Mm. So she liked Grease 1, but Grease 2 was on every day, <laughs> maybe, so I have a a problem with it. I associate it with my sister. And when you're a kid, you don't you don't like your siblings. So <laughs> I didn't want to watch that damn movie over and over. I didn't want to have to watch My Girl over and over. Mm. But uh, you, you two guys, do you have any strong opinions on Grease 2 at all? Or? Uh, I, I've seen it once. I was confused by what I was watching. <laughs> mm. I think everyone was. The, the, the confusing thing about Grease 2 to me is the fact that like, the T-Birds and the Pink Ladies is like a gang you inherit. Like, the so when all the other ones graduated, these people, they became the Pink Ladies and the T-Birds. It's like, I thought they just formed their own gangs. Like, why, why are they having to pass down the jackets and stuff? This is weird to me. But the, For the legend. Yeah, maybe that's an American thing as well. Like, because you do all, you have that sort of college, you know, the sororities and whatnot. We again, we don't have that over here. We don't have nope. like, oh, this you join a group in college and then you are now an alpha beta tau for the rest of your life and all this kind of crack. We d- d- doesn't exist unless it exists like in very up, you know, maybe in like Eton and Oxford. And yeah, whatnot. those really fancy posh schools have stuff like that. I think. Yeah, yeah but over here, like you, you just show up to university and just predominantly you just make friends and then go to go to classes and. Drink a lot and then graduate. That's, that's you just you just drink and get given a degree. I think yeah. that's the. <laughs> <laughs> just fit in some some work in the meantime, but. <laughs> I think here in the states, sororities and fraternities are mostly a place to live. 
they mm-hmm. have their houses and that's where you live instead of living in the dorms. I think that's for a lot of people the biggest point. Ah. And also a social club, a place to make friends and get to know people of similar interests to yourself. Mm. Okay. I mean, we have a There's similar thing. There's nothing like that in high school here. <laughs> they, this is completely made up. <laughs> Having jackets, unless you're part of the sport, it's like these people, both with Greece and Greece too, they wanted to have a club, mm. but they didn't want to actually join a sport or a club. They just wanted to be a group. Yeah. Yeah. So they got yeah. jackets so that they were a group. Which means that someone is making those jackets on their own dime. Mm. <gasps> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, because they don't look homemade or anything. Like, they, they haven't, you know, customized the, these cheap jackets they've got. They're very fancy jackets. Though. Yeah, well, it looks like probably, like, I, I bestow this jacket upon you <laughs> that was made, you know, by the, from the finest of leathers and stuff like that. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> Can it be vegan leather? I think that's called pleather. Well, th- this seems leather. to be a, a thing. I don't know if it's a different product, right? But I've noticed lately... It's getting branded as either vegan or vegetarian leather uh, rather than pleather. I, don't, I think there's a different kind of sheen to it. So I'm thinking maybe there's a new process involved that I'm not aware there of. There must be. Huh. Yeah. Because, oh. uh, yeah, I don't know. I should have looked this up, but I didn't know we'd start talking about <laughs> leather jackets. Since we're talking about high school, you could also mention that Michelle Pfeiffer was the, the teacher in Dangerous Minds, <gasps> went yeah. into the inner city, yes. taught all those kids how to not be... So urban, I guess. I never actually saw <laughs> Dangerous Minds. Yeah, I think that is basically the plot. And, and teach, you know, teach them to listen to Coolio. It was Coolio who did the song, was it? Yeah. <laughs> like, I think so, yeah. She's teaching them English by using rap music. Mm. Yeah, because she's cool. That's what it was. <laughs> That's how you get the I, kids involved. I'm pretty sure that Batman Returns was my first exposure to Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm. Yeah, but, probably the same. But later on in my education... I had an English teacher who was trying to teach us middle schoolers the idea of film criticism. Uh, film criticism. So she sat us down, and we had to watch the movie Lady Hawk oh. from 1985. <gasps> yeah. That's where I was first exposed to her. Uh-huh. <laughs> we watched that movie at least four or five times. Holy like, crap. Be like, I can take it from that reaction, <laughs> to... though. This is like a, an enthusiastic subject for Julia here. I'm like, oh, someone's mentioned Lady Hawk, yes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I would watch that movie four or five times. Because I'm pretty sure Michelle Pfeiffer is the Lady Hawk. She is, yes. Uh, of course, like, you know, from Lady Hawk to Catwoman. And then, of course, but, uh, but uh, <laughs> other things, though, because she's actually, you know, talking about uh, Sean Whalen and the last, you know, or the two minutes ago, having bad connections. Michelle Pfeiffer's got them up the yin yang, because, like, you know, she also appeared in previous to this, The Witches of Eastwick, which, of course... Directed by George Miller. Mm-hmm. Oh, there you go. Uh, oh. uh, tied straight into Mad Max there as well. But, uh, mm-hmm. of course, yeah, starring Jack Nicholson, and she went on to you know co-star again with him in Wolf a couple of years after this. And I remember what, like pestering my parents to rent Wolf when I was a kid, because I, <laughs> I knew the Joker and Catwoman were in it. And they're like, you know it's not, they're not playing the Joker and Catwoman. And I was like, I oh, don't care. I watched it, and I was insanely <laughs> bored. I was just like, what? And I kind of had the realization of like, oh, so they're not even playing like Joker like and Catwoman like characters. They're just oh, completely no. boring people. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, beyond that though, uh, she's actually appeared with pretty much beyond Affleck. She's all the big screen Batmans, you know, well, and Adam West actually as well, to be fair. But, uh, you know, appeared in this with uh, Michael Keaton. She then went on, she worked with Val Kilmer. In The Prince of Egypt, of course, with the uh, you know Jeff Goldblum and whatnot, and also the oh wait the uh, the animated one yeah yeah ah, and uh, okay. the ABC after school special One Too Many. She also appeared in One Fine Day with George Clooney, going on you know to be arguably the greatest Batman of all time. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I'm sure there's a lot of agreement on that. And then the film version of uh, a, Mid- a Midsummer Night's Dream from '99. She was with uh, in that with Christian Bale. So, you know, Ooh. Like, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. She's she has worked with Batman. We have to get her on the show to rank the Batman. Mm. <laughs> 
Well, now we get the entrance of uh, a character we mentioned at the start of the movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about him. Shrek's son walks in, baby. The great white dope himself, Chip Shrek. Yeah. Good old <laughs> Chip. Good old Chip. The most American name of all, I believe. <laughs> the thing is, he's not the most impressive thing in the shot because he's accompanied by, at the side, this magnificent painting of him and Christopher Walken, which is like, oh, I want that painting. Like I, I gotta, I gotta have the painting. Someone, someone out there went to the trouble <laughs> to paint that, and it's in the Warner Brothers archive somewhere. Maybe uh, what? We're gonna have to settle on how you pronounce this name. Andrew Brynarski is what I, uh, I think. It's Brynarski. Brynarski yeah. or Bryn or Brynarski. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's what it looks like. Mm. But like, does he have it? Because if, if someone painted a picture of me and Chris Walken together, I'd be like, <laughs> I'm, I need this. Like I'm having this. <laughs> yeah. this is a permanent resident in my house now. <laughs> <laughs> you say this, but he's an interesting chap. Mm. Um, there's been some controversy with him because right, he plays uh, Leatherface in the remake of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is weird because he doesn't look—he doesn't look like he should be playing Leatherface, like physique-wise. But okay. Um, now, but the controversy is the original Leatherface, uh, Gunnar Hansen. Is that how you pronounce it? Gun- yeah, yes, yeah. Gunnar. Gunnar, Gunnar Hansen. Yeah. He died, unfortunately, as you may know. But then uh, Brynjarski responded on Facebook by saying, uh, boo who, <laughs> which is a bit harsh. And then a fan replied saying, you yeah, know, nice of you to insult the legend. And Brynjarski came back again saying, right, you're going to have to edit this out now. You have to beep. Mm. Could give zero f***s, suck his dead m***s. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's a bold strategy, Cotton. <laughs> That's, uh... He couldn't just say nothing about it at all. <laughs> I know. Like if you don't care, then don't say anything. It's a bit harsh, isn't it? He tried to explain himself. He uh, he came back then saying, um, I was a big supporter of his and was cool with him. He was cool with me. Then he started going around to promote Chainsaw 3D and he started talking shit about me at cons and whatnot. I'm not somebody who takes shit from anybody and I tell it like it is. <laughs> I originally yeah. posted my comment saying boo-hoo. Um, read into it what you will. I never wished his death... Or suffering from pancreatic cancer, which I didn't even know he had. Let's make that a bigger issue upon his death. Cancer sucks worse than haters. Mm. Have a nice day. <laughs> it's like, hang on, but he's the hater. I don't understand. One of those things you're supposed to learn when you're, you know, quite young. It's like be the bigger man. Like if Gunnar Hansen's talking about you, don't hit back. Just be like, hey, he's he, especially when he's died. Yeah, it's just be like, well, he's being an asshole. I don't have to be an asshole as well. I can just be like. Yeah. He's never going to win that argument. No. Death trumps everything else. (laughs) But he seems like the kind of person who will think he's won. Mm. (laughs) Because, you know, who's going to come back at him now? It's like, well, you know, I've made my point. Nobody's disproven my point because the guy's dead. So so obviously I win. (laughs) But uh, that that did sour me on him a little bit. Mm. I did always initially love Chip Shrek as a character and... And his performance, because this is a guy who has been told, you're playing Chris Walken's son. And so he's just doing a Chris Walken impression to Walken himself when he comes in like, Dad, you know, this time has come for us to go greet the mass. You know, he's really doing the voice back to him. Imagine the just bravery or foolhardiness of walking up to a famous person like... Heaven forbid you ever get to actually meet your hero and you walk up to them, you put out your hand, you shake it. And as you're looking them dead in the eyes, you do a verbal impression (laughs) of them. And that is exactly what Andrew Brynjarski is doing to Christopher Walken. I'm not saying that he's his hero or anything like that, but he's going to his face. That would be like walking up to Shatner and being like, I'm... Very glad to meet you. I bet people have done that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Those people are called assholes. Yeah. <laughs> Every, or, or you go up to those people who go up to a famous person and just do their catchphrase at them. Yeah. Like, well, what, what, are you, what are you achieving by saying this to him? <laughs> I don't understand. I it's, yeah, as if they've not heard it before. I was like, yep, yeah, that, that's the thing that I'm famous for saying. That's yep. right. <laughs> nice, nice work. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do wonder, though, when, when Walken dies, it's like <laughs> Bryn Yars going to be on Twitter and be like, him. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't even like my impression of him in Batman Returns. I, I get the vibe he was maybe told to do it. Because you you wouldn't choose to do that in front of Christopher Walken, would you? Mm. Oh, totally. As an actor. <laughs> I can imagine 
Tim Burton pulling Andrew aside. I'm just going to call him Andrew for, you know, sake of simplicity, but pulling him aside and being like, okay, listen, Andrew, we're going to do this scene. I didn't talk to Chris ahead of time, but this would be awesome if you did it. I want you to walk into that room and I want you to put on your best walk-in impression <laughs> and we're just going to film it. And it, it worked, kind of, for us, the viewer, at least. Well, <laughs> it would be great, though, if it's like an intimidating outtake of Walkham and like, so you think you're, you think you're a tough guy, huh? It's like going into a whole big argument with him on set. And they're like, yep, so we got that take, though, right? We can still use that. <laughs> yeah, I want to see the blooper reel of uh, Andrew trying to film this scene. Like, no, 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 I can do a better impression. Let me try that again. Take 58. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird, though, because, uh, you know, Googling him, uh, you know, one of the things now will come up, like, a YouTube video of him talking about being Leatherface and whatnot. And it's like, you click on him now, he does not sound anything like this now he's got like the most insanely gruff like he swallowed like a whole bed of nails like he was like he's just like yes oh please leather face back and <laughs> it's ins- it, I don't know he's smoked 50 cigars a day in the meantime or something but like, now that his uh, voice is like that I want to hear him come back and try and do a walking impression <laughs> to walking's <laughs> face <laughs> I, oh, it's such a strange thing. Like it's like um, well, I've mentioned before. You know, I, I watch a lot of RuPaul's Drag Race, right? And there's a challenge on that where it's like um, the match game, and they have to impersonate celebrities. And there's always someone who decides, "I'm going to impersonate RuPaul," <laughs> <laughs> and it's always a disaster every time. It's a drastic failure, pretty much. Because why would you choose to do that? It's stupid. <laughs> Oh, that'd be great though. Like, ne- like the next season, some guy comes in, with like or like you know, a queen comes in with a big coat on. It's just like, Dad, time has come to <laughs> just a stupid chip track. <laughs> just reciting all his lines from the movie, and RuPaul's just like, "That's yeah, I like that. That's a deep cut. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll give you that one. <laughs> that would be amazing. I would love that." Uh, oh, uh, we we skipped over a bit of the minute actually as well. We uh, one what? of the crucial bits, but the, and our. And our desperateness to get the trip trek we uh we missed out walkins reply to the whole suggestion oh, yeah. actually more of a question business where um he does this uh oh no you know uh haven't quite housebroken miss kyle but on the plus column she does make a great cup of coffee which is and then they all do like a little crusty old asshole just doing a really condescending laugh and stuff and, and ha, 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 let's make fun of a woman yeah, it's, Some yeah. this is possibly just one of the most grating moments in this set of minutes for me. Mm. And that's me. I have no right to be <laughs> yeah. sitting here talking about the experiences of a woman in mm. the workplace. All right. Well, then I'm probably going to be the only one to think what I think about this scene. Um, yeah, I'm kind of on Max Shrek's side. Whoa. Oh. She, she has a job. She has a job description. She is to go in there. She is to offer them coffee. And she has other responsibilities outside that room. But her job in that room is to offer them coffee, not advice. Yeah, but he doesn't She's... have to belittle her to the point of calling her an animal. Okay, no, I true. I, I agree. <laughs> That's true. His belittling of her isn't completely inappropriate. But her sticking her nose in and speaking up during the meeting is inappropriate. Yeah, okay. She is okay. not, from what we know of her... She is not qualified to speak up for this meeting, and she has no authority to do so. It is not included in her job description. It's inappropriate. Ah, Maybe she thinks they have a closer relationship than they do, and and that's okay. Hmm. But and and he is under he's under no illusions. He's just like no, you're just my secretary or whatever. <laughs> yeah, it could be. She this is an attempt that you know you always hear like you take your opportunities when you can, and you know. We don't know what you know her educational background is, but we do see later on she's obviously a very intelligent person. So it could be like if if I get in here now with a a quick question, uh, a quick suggestion, maybe they'll be like, oh, uh, maybe that's they might they, they might dismiss it offhand and then be like, what she said made a lot of sense, you know. They, they, but it, it just seems that she's so flustered mm. that she can't quite get it out, and but you know, and they do all turn to her with this incredibly condescending sort of look. And it, uh, it, of course, then you know the the housebroken line, which of course, because you know she becomes Catwoman, and you know you have to <laughs> catch it. It's like ha ha, you get it, you get it, audience. 
But uh, I, I will say, though, the, the housebroken line is... It's better than what was in the original script, because yes. uh, the original line was, um, uh, Selena, go away. Do not fret, gentlemen. If our meeting goes well, I'll let you watch me spank her later. <gasps> oh, like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hashtag me, too. <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I mean, had to to- we, can, we can show him throwing her out a window, but that's a bit much. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it certainly reinforces the the point that he's a he's an absolute jerk though. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's not putting that in there to to make you go, "Oh yeah, show her." <laughs> you know? We were talking a little bit earlier about the Trump parallels. Oh god. Yes. Like, yeah. Grab a yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it. I <laughs> uh, see well, that's another reference to Catwoman. Yeah. Oh, oh, it is. <laughs> It's just too, it's too eerie. Is it? We're not going to get away with this. It'd be like after a hundred episodes, we're like, all right, we're going to have to come out with this. Damn it. And amusingly, so, yeah. on the most recent season of RuPaul's Drag Race, on the on, it's called the Snatch Game. That that thing I was saying, someone does Melania Trump. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm circling back around. <laughs> Which is just one of the queens standing there being silent. <laughs> no, it ends up being the funniest thing. By someone who hadn't been funny up until that point. So it was, <laughs> check it out, everyone. Yeah, I feel like Chip is more or less the Donald's sons rolled up into one. Yes. Like, take Donald, take the other one. What's the other one's name? Donald and Donald Jr. and Eric? Eric, That's yes. It. I haven't Eric thought about the them one. in so long well, that I forgot. I'd rather not. <laughs> But you I, take the two of them, roll them into one, and you get this guy just waltzing in and be like, Dad, Mr. Maya, <laughs> we're time to go down and bring joy to the masses. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a cane. <laughs> he's got a cane. And to be fair, like, you know, I've got a cane. So like, I'm, like, I, I, I'm fully supportive of the, of the cane carrying. <laughs> I, I, I thought of you and I saw this cane. I'll be honest. <laughs> like that guy injured my foot earlier in the year. That cane came in handy. So th- th- don't knock it until you've had to use it. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that, that's all the notes I have on the actual minutes. Do uh, you guys have anything else specific to the uh, the actual activity scene on screen? I think that's it for us. Thank you for having us on, though. Oh no, it's no oh. problem. Uh, do you have any anecdotes though about like the your memories of seeing Batman Returns at all in the? Uh... Well, unlike Julia, I grew up in a house of boys, ah. and we were the kind of family that would go out to the theater and see a movie like this. Unfortunately, considering this came out in 1992, I was not Five. old enough to be brought to a theater for something like this. And so my brother and I first saw this movie after renting it from a video store, because we saw the original we with michael keaton we saw the follow-up because that was the next thing we rented Mm. and i think what caught my attention most was definitely the penguin part but i will always remember how i reacted and how i felt when i saw how max shrek ends up in this movie (laughs) that image that last final image of Max Shrek has been burned into my memory in much the same way that he's burned into the film. Yeah. So I won't say more than that for the sake of, you know, continuity, but I very, I have a lot of memories of this movie mm. that are very pleasant. I'm exactly the opposite. Ooh. I think I saw this movie for the first time all the way through when we were invited on to join you on the podcast oh my god really oh this this yeah, is the I best think i had seen bits and pieces of it before then so nothing came as a big surprise mm-hmm. to me but i think seeing it full all the way through that was the first time I don't... and the image that's burned into my head is what danny devito's body looks like <laughs> Oh. It's very disturbing. It's wrong. It's wrong on many levels. It really is. Did you get surprised, though, by just how um, explicit he's allowed to be in this film, <laughs> considering it is still aimed at children? That's true. Is this movie really aimed at children? <sighs> well, that's the problem. I think Tim Burton doesn't see it that way. Warner Brothers do and did try and market it to kids. <laughs> I think they, they, they did bring it up. Again, an interview with... 
Daniel Waters were like, he just said like him and Tim were just like just was writing down anything we wanted. We <laughs> at, at no point did they consider like well, you know this is gonna have like a Happy Meal tie and stuff. They were never thi- oh, and those Happy Meal toys were excellent. <laughs> 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 but the, but yeah, that, it never crossed their minds of like this should be catering to kids. They were like, we're just writing whatever we want to write, and then that's going to be the movie. And that's I was just like, well, well fair enough. You know, we can't. You know, we got a great movie out of it, in my opinion, anyway. So, uh, well, yeah, it worked for for us, like the viewers. I think it worked excellently. But you can understand why Warner Brothers weren't happy. Yeah, <laughs> it's like uh, <laughs> it's not what they're trying to market. Hmm. Mm. But yeah, like uh, that's uh, I'm I'm ready to go wrap this week up. Uh, you guys obviously more than welcome to come back for Batman Forever if you should so want to do so. We'll uh, understand if you don't want to. It's uh, not quite <laughs> as good a film, I'll be honest. Um, we we will go. We will let you all enjoy the rest of your Friday and going into your weekend and whatnot. But one last time. Would you like to tell the listeners, if they're very forgetful weirdo freaks or, you know, or they've only just joined us now, where they can find your podcast and you to chat to? It doesn't matter if they are weird, forgetful freaks or not. We take all shapes and sizes over here at the Mad Max Minute, where you can find us on our homepage, MadMaxMinute.com. We are also on Twitter at Mad Max Minute if you want to tweet at us. If you are more in the speed of Facebook, we you, we can be found by searching for the Mad Max Minute, where you can find our listener page, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. And as far as listening services, we are on iTunes, Google Play, and just about any podcast aggregator that you could probably find out there. We've probably been <laughs> scooped up by their RSS trawlers. It does baffle me how that works. You, you you pop up in some strange places when you Google your own show. <laughs> oh yeah, but uh, yeah, do do check the show out. Subscribe and uh, and rate these guys five stars because it's wonderful, wonderful show, wonderful movies as well. I I'm a big fan of the first Mad Max. I know some people skip that one. I think it's great, and so you should go back to the start of their podcast. In fact, yes, mm-hmm. do or, or no, listen to our episodes first on. Uh, on Beyond Thunderdome, and then go back. <laughs> I'm a great though. Rick, Rick and Julia, are like, yeah, we don't like the first one. We started with the Road Warrior. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Julia loves the first movie. Yes, it's still my favorite. Good. I, I mean, I, I would say it's my least favorite, right? But I, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. It's very different. You know, I can see why fans of two might think it's not as exciting. Maybe it's not as crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's still plenty crazy. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> it's a weird movie. But anyway, yes. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. We will be back on Monday. We will have new minutes. We will have new guests. And in the meantime, if you want to chat to us, we're all over the net. Just just type us into Google or something. I can't be bothered today. It's Friday. Chill out. Have a beer or something. We're on Facebook as well. We're at the, the Listener's Cave where you can chat to us and uh, well, everyone. Scott Corelli's on there. You all like Scott Corelli. He'll, he'll chat to you when I'm too lazy to. So, yes, au revoir, and see you on Monday. Next time, Corndog Cornucopia, as a chagrined subordinate spouts soft swear words while skyscraper bound, what kind of umbrella hoisting umbra can be sighted underground? Find out next week. Same bat pod, different bat minute.